UFC Sao Paulo recently wrapped up, and I'm going to recap the entire card, starting from the first fight of the night and working my way up to the main event. So make sure you guys smash that like button, and if you're new to the channel, subscribe. And let's jump right into the card. First fight of the night, Mark Jacasey versus Kawe Fernandez. You know, it ended up being a split decision on the official judges scorecards, but I think there was a little Brazilian bias there. I definitely thought Mark Jacasey had done enough to earn a decision in this fight. Definitely won the third round. I think you can give him the first and even the second two. Kawe Fernandez has some nice kicks and Mark Jacasey's striking game has definitely proven to not be his strongest area anymore. He's more of like a grind heavy grappler. He wrestles, he controls from top, and he grinds opponents out and wins decision. And that's how he beat Kawe Fernandez. This is going to do nothing for the Mark Jacasey stock moving forward. I'm not like, yo, I can't wait to see Mark Jacasey fight X fighter next. But he is on the roster still. I think they're going to continue to feed him mid-level guys. And I feel like he's more of an, uh, you know, slightly above average gatekeeper at this point of his career. A debuting guy like Kawe Fernandez to go distance with him. I think that these type of all positions he'll be fed more to, and he's going to eventually catch some L's. There's some dangerous prospects, I guess, because of this win here. He probably gets a veteran the next time out, but irregardless of it, I'm not overly impressed by Jacasey's performance. He definitely mixes in the wrestling well, but his striking has just become a bit underwhelming. It's not like he doesn't have any stand-up. He hits with some power, sure, and he's a really athletic guy. But it's like a skill set that really never improved. Like, I feel like Mark Jacasey's stand-up is equivalent to how it's always been. We never saw it get better. So early on, it was like, okay, this guy's got this good development striking game as a debut and prospect. But now, long-time UFC vet, we've seen the ceiling. And I think the ceiling lies at mid to slightly above average mid-tier gatekeeper he beat Kawe Fernandez good W in the first fight of the night for Mark Jacasey next fight on the card it's Eduardo Mora versus Montserrat Kanehu Ruiz this fight in all actuality was such a mismatch Kanehu was levels below Eduardo Mora I mean if you look at Kanehu's frame first and foremost she probably should be at 105 and Mora could easily be fighting at women's 125. I mean, she nearly weighed 120 pounds at weigh-ins. She looked huge. It looked like a women's bantamweight versus a women's atom weight. And Mora destroyed Kaneho Ruiz on the ground, got a ground and pound stoppage because of a merciful ref. I was glad that he jumped in because there was nothing happening for Montserrat Kaneho Ruiz besides pure survival, and she was getting her face beat in. There's no reason for it. Good stoppage. I think Eduardo Mora is scary. She's a big girl. She's strong on the ground. She's ferocious. I like the attitude she's got going for her. She's got a good feel to her game. I believe after the fight, uh, she called out, was it Diana Belbita or am I mistaken? I think it was. I might be mixing it up though. But I know she called out a lady that I'm like 80% sure is Belbita. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments who she called out. But I'm pretty sure it was Belbita. I would be willing to move forward and say that that's probably not next right away, but she is going to get a slight jump up in competition. At least give her somebody that's 5'3". Give her somebody that has a fair size shot, not a 5-foot Montserrat Canejo who should be at 105 pounds, not even 115. It's probably on her way out of the UFC with three losses in a row. Big win for Mora, though. It was a good debut. She beat up Montserrat Canejo. Not even close. Next fight on the card, Angela Hill, Denise Gomes. I picked Angela Hill as an underdog, and she turned out to be an amazing underdog. Beating a game, Denise Gomes, by decision. She was able to smother Gomes a bit in the clinch. She also was able to touch her with a fair amount of strikes, and she gave her a lot of difficulty in this fight with her experience. You could see Angela Hill had been in there with, you know, a ton of vets. You can kind of see that veteran savvy tricks and tactics and her knowledge of the game was superior to a good prospect in Denise Gomes. But yo, 23 years old to take on Angela Hill. I just think it's, you know, it's an expected result. It was too steep of a competition jump. Knocking out Yasmin Yeraigoy and Bruno Brazil is great. 
but it's not, I'm going to beat Angela Hill now, who took out Lupe Godinez, who's a great prospect as well. I think Angela Hill has proven that she's still an upper echelon female contender. She's gone rounds with top girls in the world, like an Amanda Lemos split. She's fought everybody. She's fought everyone. And she takes out Denise Gomes, who's a prospect, who she should beat, and she was a dog here. And looking at her future in the game, she said she's down for all rematches to take on everybody that's beaten her before. I don't know what's next. To be honest, I have no idea what direction they'll go with Angela Hill. But I think you give her a veteran. I think you can give her somebody in the rankings. Prospect that they're looking to try to turn up a notch. They're going to have a hard time beating Angela Hill. I like Angela Hill's game a lot. Denise Gomes has got great potential. She's 23 years old. She's got so much time. Just not yet. Not yet. Next fight on the card. Vitor Petrino, Modestus Bukowskis. You know, for the most part of the first round, it was a little bit of kickboxing and Bukaus is kind of getting the better of Petrino with the legs. And then Petrino picks him up and slams him and steals the round with, uh, you know, a bit of ground and pound from top. And then the flatline KO early in round two was pretty epic. It was a left hook as Bukowskis was coming in with a bit of a wide jab with his rear hand very low and his head kind of coming forward with the shot, which perfectly set up the hook, that flatline Modestus Bukowskis. Now, he did wake up upon landing on the floor, but I think it was very good that the ref stopped the fight because I believe Petrino would have delivered some career-altering ground and pound from top position. So I was happy with the call to stop the fight. Petrino hits really hard. He's super physically strong. He's 26. He's still a developing fighter. And I really think best bet for Petrino, if the goal is to build him as a future contender in the UFC light heavyweight division, it's about patience. We don't need to rush him up the ranks with just three UFC fights. I think you give him somebody amongst the similar levels of a Modestus Bukowskis in the rankings. Like, I think you don't want to give Petrino too much of a jump with somebody that's towards the top 15 or even somebody with a tricky style. Like imagine they gave him a, a Daun Jung. It's kind of a risky matchup. I don't want to see him jumping too far up the ranks to take on somebody that does have a chance to sleep him with the hands or stop the grappling onslaught. It's not that he can't take an L, you know what I'm saying? The vast majority of fighters eventually take an L, but you could marinate his skill set before you give him the jump. Like, I kind of feel like you're better off keeping him with mid-tier guys than trying to turn the, uh, you know, skill set bar of the opposition on hot. Because right now, I like the lukewarm level, the mid-levels, okay fighters. Give them light heavyweights that have skills that can present challenges but not exceedingly dangerous guys because he's 26, he's really young, and he's at light heavyweight where fighters tend to reach the prime later. Now, granted, John Jones, champ at 23, very different case. Petrino is 26, he's young in the game, and I think he's got a bright future in the sport. He uh, flatlined Modestus Bukowskis, who will still be on the roster. It's just the power differential was vast. Next fight. Was our featured prelim of the night. It's Elizio Zaleski versus Renat Fakradinov. It ended up being a draw, and I think that it absolutely exposed Renat Fakradinov. I felt like Fakradinov's ceiling was pretty high, and I thought that there was a chance he would blast through Zaleski on his way to being a legit top 15 contender. But, you know. It didn't end up going that way. I will say, Fakhradinov looked like an absolute madman early in the first round and looked on his way to a first-round TKO win after he hurt Zaleski with a wide hook early in the fight. But then Zaleski survived that early storm and gave Fakhradinov hell. I did score the first two rounds for Renat Fakhradinov. I did score the third round a 10-9, but like I don't hate the 10-8 because Fakhradinov was badly hurt by a body kick and he was put down ground and pounded and he didn't look good I mean granted he ended up the fight on top at the very end but he didn't do damage from there he's mostly surviving and then standing up Zaleski fought like hell and now we have a draw between these two ending in a draw is so weird it was also unfortunate because I did have Renat Fakhradinov as the lock and it ends up being a draw 
So it doesn't give me 10 win streak. It gives me a 10 week unbeaten streak, but it would have been nice to say a 10 week lock win streak. It is what it is. The unbeaten streak does continue because we haven't taken an L with the locks in a while, but damn, this felt like an L though, because we didn't get the W. Elizio Zaleski's game as hell. His takedown defense was strong, especially later in the fight. And he gave Renat Fakhradinov all he could handle. And Fakhradinov's predictable. Wide hooks, pressure, takedown attempts. And he's not super crisp with his stand-up. Zaleski now is going to send him backwards. Fakhradinov looked bad in the third round. He looked flat in the third round. The gas tank in round three is not optimal. And at 32, I'm going to go out on a whim and say I don't think Fakhradinov is contendership material. I don't see him as a ranked fighter in the UFC. After this draw, I don't hate the idea of them running it back. I know the UFC is not crazy about throwing fights right back that aren't like high-tier championship fights, but they made Alonzo Menafield versus Jimmy Crute. They made an immediate rematch there. This one here, I guess it didn't end with any foul, so it could potentially lessen the chance, but I'm kind of intrigued by seeing them just do it again. Run it back. Let's see who's the better man. Let's see if we can get a winner out of this. Renat Fakhradinov's stock took a loss, a real loss here in the featured prelim. Zaleski, though, I think he looked good. I think this was a good performance for Zaleski. I think his stock continues to go up. Next fight, the main card opener. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. It's Elves Brenner versus Kainan Kruczewski. You know, in the first round, which I guess it was a one-round fight, I'll say the first Three minutes and 30 seconds. I would say it was a pretty competitive striking affair where both guys had some shots landed. Brenner, though, showed that he has legit thud in his punches. He landed a hook that literally hit right above Kruczewski's ear and absolutely flattened him. It was a sick KO. It was like one shot, sleep, completely unconscious. Elves Brenner at 26... Fighting out of shoot their box, Diego Lima, undefeated in the UFC, and he looks like he keeps getting better. Now, to be fair, Kainan Kruczewski took this fight on day's notice. He showed up with a beer belly, and normally he's in pretty good shape. And this was a super short notice fight, and it was at 165 catch weight. So it wasn't like an optimal situation for Kainan Kruczewski, but Brenner ran him over in the first round. So it kind of like leaves no doubt. Elves Brenner's stock continues to jump up. And I think he has a bright future, man. 26, 3-0 in the UFC. Sick KO here. Back-to-back -back KO wins. I'm excited what they do with Elves Brenner. I think he's got... I think he's got some good fights in him. I think he's got some exciting performances. Now, don't rush him to the rankings. Let's keep him... Let's keep him against the lower tier, guys. Let's not rush... Him up the ranks. Maybe him versus Mark Jacasey. Maybe. Next fight. Kyle Barajo versus Abu Smagomedov. Kyle Barajo definitely deserved the win. Finished strong. And I think that we can affirm and say from now on, Abu Smagomedov is not uh, adept for a three-round fight. He's not optimal in the later stages. When we get into those later rounds, his fatigue sets in, and he seems to wilt a bit on himself after he gets hit by big shots, but he does fight his way back, and he survived the late onslaught by Kaio Baraiho, but he clearly lost the fight. I did score the first round for A-Boost, but I think the second definitely was uh, Kaio Baraiho's, and the third was absolutely Baraiho's. He beat the shit out of A-Boost Magomedov in round three. Baraiho, right after the fight, decides to go for the big guns of the weight class, and call out Drakus Duplessis, I think that's a little bit too far up of a jump for him to call out, and probably he won't be booked against somebody like a Drakus Duplessis right away, but I like where his head's at, that he's calling for a title shot, that he's challenging the bigger names in the weight class. I think let's work you up the ranks. Like, let's just get to the top 15. Let's see here. Let me look at the UFC rankings for this division. I should probably have already had them up. But you know what? I'll pull them up right now. All right. Middleweight division. Number 15 in the world is Anthony Fluffy Hernandez. You know, I think that Kyle Barayo beats Anthony Hernandez. I like that fight. Chris Curtis. I think that's a winnable fight for him as well. 
Paul Craig is now number 13. Granted, he's fighting Brendan Allen. I feel like the fight with Fluffy Hernandez could be interesting. I kind of like the idea of that for Kyle, but I always, we break him into the rankings against the number 15 guy in the world. I like that matchup. Abu Smagomedov, not a contender. Sent back. Tough dude. Decent kickboxing, but he's not one of the best middleweights on the planet. No chance of it. Kyle Barayo got a W, pulled it off, and I think he's got a pretty bright future in the game. I like the personality he brings. I like the flair. He's a likable guy. Featured bout. Rodrigo Nascimento and Dante Mays 2. Like I've said all week, it was the rematch nobody asked for, but it ended up actually being a pretty good fight. They scrapped, and Nascimento looked like he had Dante Mays out of there in the first round. Ended up actually saying that he broke his hand after the fight in that first round. But Nascimento was able to win a decision, deservingly so. Dante Mays did better than last time, but dude, he like lacks speed. He's just not a fast fighter. Nascimento clearly had the quicker hands. I feel like with Nascimento, you might as well give him a shot against somebody at the upper echelon. Like, what are we doing? At this point, we might as well. Heavyweight, who's number 15? Martin Boudet. I could see Boudet and Nascimento fighting. I could see him fighting Marco Sejiro de Lima. I could see him fighting Alexander Romanov. I could see them throwing him Jarzinho Rosenstroik. Now, granted, I like a different fight for Jarzinho, but we'll talk about that later in the video. I think him and Martin Boudet or Marco Sejiro de Lima is very interesting. I think it's about time we give Nascimento a shot. At the upper echelon. He is 11-1. and one. He's on an unbeaten streak. Four fights in a row. That won no contest. You know, which is four fights ago. He did win. You know, it got overturned. I feel like with Dante Mays, though, we just, we know his ceiling is not crazy high. He's not a guy that's going to be fighting in the rankings. He's a tough, lower to mid-tier out, but he's always going to be game and he'll go hard rounds. And he's got a damn good chin on him. I said during the live stream, I was like, you know what? Dante Mays, if it doesn't work out in the UFC, I think he could get signed to BKFC. I think he can take some bare knuckle fists. So who knows what the future holds for him after this loss. But uh, Nascimento, solid performance. Gets his second win over Dante. Co-main event of the evening. This was a crazy upset. And honestly, I'm still digesting this fight. Gabriel Bonfim looked awesome early on, was touching up Dalby with punches, got on top of him, beat him up. He was beating him up in the second round as well. But then you see them get back up to his feet, and it's like the life is sucked out of Bonfim. Now he's running out of gas, and he has a Nicholas Dalby who has lost zero confidence in himself, who continues to press forward and throw hard shots, who's in Gabriel Bonfim's face. Then what does he do? He rips him up in the clinch. He drops a knee that puts Bonefeam down. Multiple knees landed before, but one big one that drops Bonefeam. Ground and pound from the top position. And Nicholas Dalby TKOs one of the brightest Brazilian prospects on the sport right now and breaks his undefeated record, now 15-1. and one. It was insane, man. Because I really thought Bonefeam was the goods. I thought he was ready for that shift. I'm like, he can beat a Nicholas Dalby. No, he got broken and beaten. 15-1 and one now. To go undefeated in this game, very unlikely. 15 in a row was beautiful to look at, but it didn't last. Nicholas Dalby wants someone in the rankings now. Do we just give it to him? After you win a historic upset like this, does he just deserve to get pushed up to the rankings? I mean, he'll take on anybody. Renat Fakhradinov is ranked number 15. But I think after his fight against uh, Zaleski, he might be jumping out of the rankings. Maybe Nicholas Dalby is in the rankings. I said I could see Nicholas Dalby versus Michael Chiesa next. I'm curious to see that matchup. I would pick that one as a potential fight to make. Now, if they did give him Renat Fakhradinov, because Renat is ranked, and if they don't want to go the rematch route, I mean, I'd definitely tune in. But I'm thinking we give him 15 or 14. Probably we give him the Maverick Michael Chiesa. But maybe they throw him Fakhradinov. For Bonefim, it was too much too soon. And it's unfortunate to see a prospect go down like that. But we've seen it so many times. It's how this game goes. Bonefim's 26. He's got years and years ahead of him. Take this loss in stride. Dust yourself off. Get back in the gym. 
correct the flaws, the gas tank will improve, and now he knows how to deal a little bit better with somebody who's not going to break. He's not taking on mid-tier guys. Dalby is an absolute pit bull. The guy doesn't break mentally. He's a fucking Viking, and he fucked Bonefim up. It was a sick W, but I still believe in Bonefim a lot. I do think he has a bright future. It's just not yet. Not yet. There was great moments for him in the fight. He looked awesome. Just got to get that gas tank on point. Got to get that gas tank right. He wasn't able to deal with the pressure. He never felt somebody that didn't break. Dalby was that dude. Main event of the evening. Jailton Almeida versus Derek Lewis. Guys, if you haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. I'm smiling. But in all actuality, we should be upset. This turned out to be one of the worst main events of the year because Jailton Almeida chose to control Derek Lewis from top position but take minimal risks as far as delivering damage. There was times in the fight where he was on top of Derek Lewis in the full mount with the referee threatening to stand them up. That doesn't make sense. And it's not the referee's fault in this case. It's the fault of Jailton Almeida for being so complacent to just hold position and not throw. He was threatening with arm triangles. He couldn't tap Derek Lewis. He would throw some ground and pound, but never committed to doing significant damage to Derek Lewis. He was fearful, for the most part, of Derek Lewis getting back up to his feet. And obviously, he had a lot of respect for the Derek Lewis punching power. Fair, for sure. But it was a, it was a rough one. It was five rounds of dominance. A decision. Like, I never think of decision and Derek Lewis in the same sentence. It's so rare. Especially five rounds. He'd never gone five rounds. It didn't make sense to me. I couldn't fathom that they're going to go five. I'm like, okay, either Jelton submits him or Derek Lewis sleeps him. Derek Lewis had a couple moments, but for the most part was absolutely manhandled in the grappling. Like, Jelton Almeida looked dominant for sure. He has good skills, but not getting the finish and not putting on the performance. Like, this was the chance of a lifetime to build your fan base. If he runs through Derek Lewis and hunted for that finish, everybody's screaming Jelton's name. Now, I think a lot of people are like, don't give him a huge fight next. Just rebook the Curtis Blades fight. Don't give him gone. I don't want to put my guy gone in a spot where he could get submitted easily like that. Give him Curtis. He called gone out right after the fight. That's why I mentioned gone. I can see the gone fight happening next. But it's like, how much are they invested in Jelton? He's got the skill set. But if he's willing to just sit and mount and do nothing, besides just sit on his opponent and hold his arms... That's concerning moving forward. At the end of the day, it's the fight game, but it's also the entertainment business. And Jelton Almeida was lackluster in the entertainment aspect of the game because he didn't hunt for a finish when I think there was opportunities. If you're mounting someone, if you start throwing some elbows, you start, you start throwing some big shots, I think he's TKO and Derek Lewis, but he didn't want to take the risk. His risk management was crazy high, which ultimately did lead him to a successful win where he took very minimal damage. But it didn't raise his stock as far as the entertainment value side. Sure, he dominated Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis has never been a good grappler. He's been a strong guy that can get back up to his feet, but he's a knockout artist. He is purely a striker. Derek Lewis is a stand-up fighter, or he's throwing big ground and pound. He does have ground and pound. And he got on top of Jailton for a short bit of time and threw some big bombs. This starts to make me wonder if Jailton Almeida should commit to the weight cut. And let's just get down to 205. So you don't have to deal with these big giants like Derek Lewis. A fight against Curtis Blades is interesting because Curtis Blades is a very good wrestler. And what happens when Jailton... Can't get fights to the floor. We still don't know anything about his stand-up. Supposedly, he boxed growing up. Supposedly. But we know so little. He seems like a pure grappler at this point. Get on top, beat opponents up. Pure grappling. I want to see more from Jailton. I still like him as a prospect. I think he's very skilled. But I don't like that he didn't hunt for that finish. Derek Lewis on the other side. Can we just make the fight? Him versus Jarzinho Rosenstreich already? For so long, I've wanted to see it. Can we just book the fight, please? Him and Jarzinho Rosenstreich, 2024. Just put the battle of strikers together. I think Jarzinho's shooting on him, though. Jarzinho's going to try to wrestle him because Derek Lewis is going to make him feel that power. I'd pick Lewis by KO, I think. But Jelton, he needs 
to the show more killer instinct at this point. I mean, Derek Lewis wasn't easy to put away. He's not. He's a hard guy to finish, sure. But Jailton had such dominant positions. I mean, you have full mount. You have the back. Like, it seems like every chance to stop Derek Lewis was there, but he just didn't throw enough to get it done. So now moving forward into what's next, do they want to throw him Cyril Ghan? They might say no. I mean, I'd watch the fight between him and Ghan. I'd be curious of the stylistic matchup. I guess if you beat Derek Lewis, they're not going to throw you backwards. Sorry, Curtis Blades. Even though I think Curtis is a really hard fight for Jailton, Curtis might need to beat somebody else. Jailton, on the other hand, there's a real chance, though, that they do give him Cyril Ghan in a real striker versus grappler fight. And I think there's a real chance he could submit Cyril Ghan. And then he's kind of cemented himself in the title picture to challenge for the belt. I do think he's going to finish a lot of guys. I feel like Derek Lewis is like a weird exception to it. So does it harm the stock? I guess for me, it doesn't harm the stock. No. Jail Ten Almeida is still a monster. I mean, he still killed Derek Lewis. It was a one-sided fight. But he didn't finish him. He didn't submit him. That was the only thing. We wanted to see that. It is what it is. We didn't get it. Jail Ten Almeida was still a menacing force and didn't lose a round. He won, what, 50-45, 50-44, 50-44, I believe. Derek Lewis on the other side still was throwing hard and like there's no quitting Derek Lewis. The dude's tough and he's got solid submission defense because he just dealt with the best jujitsu in the heavyweight division and he didn't get tapped out. But nonetheless, his jujitsu never looks good. Derek Lewis is, he uses explosiveness and power to get back up to his feet that here for a lot of it was ineffective. He did get up in moments, but Jelton just didn't commit to throwing big ground and pound. Like it went five rounds, but like, Come on, if he put the pedal to the metal, could he not have TKO'd Derek Lewis? That's how I feel. But it is what it is. I'm going to say I'll give Jelton the gun fight. I want to see it. I'm curious. I'm curious. I still think Jelton could eventually drop to 205. And damn, think about that division. Alex Pereira could very well be champion after next Saturday. Someone that Jelton Almeida has a crazy grappling advantage on. Yidi Prohashka, somebody who's an amazing striker, but advantage in the grappling. I don't know. I think Jelton is looking at heavyweight as the easier division, but I feel like he could make 205, and I'd be very curious to see him drop back down to 205, and could he work towards contendership there? But why would he cut weight when he's beating up all these big heavyweights? Let's see how the Gon fight goes. Jelton Almeida versus Gon next. Derek Lewis versus Jarzinho Rosenstreich is a must. <clears throat> Guys, I do want to review the picks. I want to talk about my record. So for the card, my record was... Seven wins, two losses, and one draw. I won with Jelton Almeida over Derek Lewis. I lost with Bonefim versus Dalby, as probably everybody did. I won with Nascimento over Mays. I lost with Abus Magomedov over Kyle Barayo. Turned out to be a terrible, terrible pick. I won with Elves Brenner over Kainan Kruczewski. I drawed. The lock of the week drawed. But I'm still unbeaten in the last 10 weeks. I haven't lost. But I did have a draw, which does uh, end the win streak but haven't lost. So I'm saying I'm 10 weeks unbeaten and I'm bouncing back with a vengeance for 295 then. Petrino won. I picked him. Hill won. I picked her as a dog. Mora won. I picked her. And then Mark Jacasey won. I picked him. So overall, the picks were pretty good. 7-2-1. and one. Underdog call with Angela Hill. It just sucks that the lock ended in a draw. And, uh, you know, now we're on an unbeaten streak of 10 rather than the winning streak of 10, which I was hoping for. But it is what it is. Because I'm bringing the heat every single day of the week. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the recap show. Make sure you smash the like button if you're new. Subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you thought of the fights in the comments. Did you think Derek Lewis versus Jailton Almeida was a horrible fight? What do I think? Is it the worst fight of all time? No, but it definitely was one of the most lackluster main events of the year. It was definitely a lackluster fight. It was a fight that just left me wanting more. Because I wonder after, couldn't Jelton have put the pedal to the metal and stopped him? Could we have seen a TKO in that first or second round? Guess not. Guess not. Thank you guys for tuning in. Much love to each and every one of you. Keep your eyes peeled for the UFC 295 picks, which I'll be dropping today if you're watching this on uh, November 5th. Thank you guys. Much love. And I'll see you all in the next one. Peace, everybody.